Now it's time for the last word with Lawrence O'Donnell. Good evening, Lawrence. Good evening, Alex. And we have our special master team ready to go here uh, to begin the hour. They have been studying this order by the judge, which really is, uh, I, I believe it actually contains the line by a Trump judge that is the Trumpiest thing a Trump judge has ever said. Uh, and I will, I will be identifying that line. I want to know what that line no, is, no, Lawrence. No, there are no. a lot of very Trumpy lines yes, in there, there that could be emblazoned but on the back of a MAGA mug. Alex, you're just going to have to watch the TV show to get that line. It's Same only, piece. it's about, it's about, let me think, it's about four minutes away. It's going to be here. I'm waiting. Okay. I'll be here for Stay it. Stay right have there for four show, more Lawrence. minutes. You'll hear it. Thank you, Alex. Well, the Trump appointed judge in the appropriately titled case of Donald J. Trump versus United States of America, once again gave Donald Trump just about everything he is asking for in court in an order appointing a so-called special master to examine all of the evidence seized by the FBI from Donald Trump's Florida residence. The one good thing in the judge's ruling is naming Raymond Deary as the special master in the case. He was the only possible special master who was acceptable to both sides. And if Raymond Deary is, actually does carry out his duties as the special master, he is, by all accounts, an honorable federal judge who would handle his responsibilities in this case honorably and professionally and as expeditiously and responsibly as possible. He is the only good thing in this judge's ruling, which of course should not even include the order of a special master. The judge refused the Justice Department's request to withhold 100 classified documents from examination by the special master. But Judge Aileen Mercedes Cannon did modify her previous order to clarify that federal investigators can use all of the evidence that they seized, including the classified documents, in several ways in their ongoing criminal investigation. Once again, Judge Cannon made a new, utterly shocking statement in her new order. The judge actually said in writing that she does not believe that the hundred documents clearly marked as classified and identified by the Department of Justice as classified documents actually are classified documents. The judge offered absolutely no evidentiary basis for why she does not believe the documents are classified. Judge Cannon wrote that she is not, quote, prepared to adopt hastily that all of the approximately 100 documents isolated by the government and papers physically attached to them are classified government records. That is the single most Trumpian thing a Trump judge has ever said or written. When Donald Trump said, I could stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody and I wouldn't lose any voters, he did not say that he would not get arrested. He did not say that a New York judge would throw out the case. He said he wouldn't lose voters. And he said that before he became president of the United States. And now six years later, the tragic reality of American jurisprudence is that Donald Trump can get caught with documents marked classified and a federal judge who he appointed will say, how do we know they're classified? There is no more vivid demonstration of the poison that Donald Trump has injected into the federal judiciary. And a federal judge saying, I have no way of knowing the documents seized by the FBI with a search warrant that are marked classified and have been identified by the FBI and the Justice Department as classified, actually are classified. That is the Alice in Wonderland that exists in that judge's courtroom. That is flat earth society thinking in the federal judiciary, thanks to Donald Trump.
Donald Trump and his lawyers have presented absolutely no evidence whatsoever, not even the suggestion of evidence, not the hint of evidence to Judge Cannon that those documents are not classified. She just made that up. The Department of Justice has presented full and convincing evidence that those documents are classified, including an under oath affidavit by the FBI's assistant director for the counterintelligence division of the FBI. At the same time, Judge Cannon says there is no reason for anyone to be worried about who has seen those classified documents in the year and a half that Donald Trump had them in his possession? No reason to worry about who Donald Trump might have shown those documents to or who might have obtained copies of those documents without Donald Trump even knowing. Absolutely nothing to worry about in a year and a half of those documents being completely unprotected. Judge Cannon says she does not see, quote, any identifiable emergency or imminent disclosure of classified information arising from plaintiffs' allegedly unlawful retention of the seized property. That is precisely the objective of the criminal investigation and of the intelligence community review of the damage done by Donald Trump in this case. And if the government already knows about some very serious damage that could have been done by Donald Trump's handling and mishandling of those documents. That may be a classified finding right now that they cannot disclose. Judge Cannon is in effect saying she doesn't understand what's so important about keeping classified documents classified. What's the big deal? And so she is ordering a special master to examine all of the classified documents and her order allows Donald Trump's lawyers, none of whom have security clearances, none of whom have ever seen a classified document, to examine all of the classified documents. Judge Cannon admits that her previous order barring use of the seized evidence in the Justice Department's criminal investigation went too far. In her new order, she says that further elaboration is warranted. That's the phrase she used. And so she now says she only wants to prevent the Justice Department from, quote, for example, presenting the seized materials to a grand jury and using the content of the documents to conduct witness interviews as part of a criminal investigation. The order does not restrict the government from conducting investigations or bringing charges based on anything other than the actual content of the seized materials, from questioning witnesses and obtaining other information about the movement and storage of seized materials, including documents marked as classified, without discussion of their contents. Judge Cannon says the Justice Department is allowed to brief congressional leaders with intelligence oversight responsibility on the seized materials and that the FBI can now be involved in the intelligence community's security assessment. Judge Cannon now says, quote, to the extent that such intelligence review becomes truly and necessarily inseparable from criminal investigative efforts concerning the content of the seized material the order does not enjoin the government from proceeding with its security assessments. The judge named, as expected, senior federal judge Raymond Deary as the special master because he was the only person who was acceptable to both sides in the case. She gave Judge Deary a deadline of November 30th to complete his work, work that has never been done before in the history of American jurisprudence, nothing like it, work that a Trump-appointed federal judge is ordering only because she believes that Donald Trump alone, among the 330 million of us, deserves special treatment. Not just a special master, but special treatment in federal court. 
Leading off our discussion tonight is Neil Katyal, former acting U.S. Solicitor General, also with us Andrew Weissman, former FBI General Counsel and former Chief of the Criminal Division in the Eastern District of New York. He is Professor of Practice at NYU Law School. They are both MSNBC legal analysts. And also with us is Bradley Moss, a national security attorney with experience in classified documents cases. Uh, Andrew Weissman, let me begin with you. And I'm going to give each of you just an open mic uh, to give us whatever you're thinking about what you have read tonight from this judge. Well, Lawrence, there's so much to choose from. Uh, and I'm, I'm certainly going to leave a lot on the table for Neil and Brad, because there, there's so many outrageous um, and stupid, frankly, uh, pieces of this decision. I mean, it's, just, it's remarkable because you never thought there'd be something worse than her last decision, mm -hmm. and this actually topped it. But let me um, focus on something I thought was um, particularly uh, important, and then also go to something that's maybe positive. So one of the things that I thought was particularly egregious is that she comes right out and says at the end of her decision, that she's giving extra weight to Trump because he was the president. She just comes right out and says it. That, if, if anyone wants to see the end of the rule of law, it is just read the decision. Um, you know, John Locke famously said, where law ends, tyranny begins. You read this decision and what she said, and she is admitting that the position that the person held is going to carry extra weight in terms of how he is treated in court. That is a violation of her oath as a judge to treat everyone the same. I, I found that just so shocking. And I'll, I'll leave to Neil and to Brad all sorts of other things. But now we turn to something positive, which you mentioned, which is because she is also, I think, frankly, a chicken um, she could be doing all of this review herself, but she's decided to have a special master. Well, that is a big plus for the department here because Raymond Deary is a real step up. I mean, in complete different league than this judge. And so by her subcontracting out her own duties, it actually, and I think she's thinking, you know, let him be the fall guy. Let him have to say uh, Donald Trump is wrong because then her hands are somewhat clean. I think that is what's going on here. Um, I mean, it's really disgraceful that that's the way she's approaching her job. But from the, the Department of Justice's point of view, I think that there's um, a lot of hope that they should have given Judge Deary's track record and his common sense and integrity. Neil Katyal, go. So, Lawrence, you've heard of Oliver Wendell Holmes, John Marshall, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. This is like the polar opposite of them. Um, and, you know, we used to say in the Solicitor General's office that some appeals write themselves. This is one. And it is a terrible, terrible abuse of our legal system for reasons that Andrew just mentioned a moment ago. And it was also entirely unnecessary. The Justice Department gave this judge an opportunity to walk back her not so early opinion, earlier opinion. And instead, she chose to dig her heels in. I mean, Bill Barr called this request for a special master a crock of S-word. And while I thought that was kind of mean to crocs, this opinion is like a crock of the crock of the S-word. I um, mean, the Justice Department gave her a lifeline and she just blew it off. And I can tell you this decision should be reversed within a week. And the Justice Department gave her that sensible proposal of saying, look, there's a hundred documents. He has no, Trump has no plausible claim to ownership of these documents. They're obviously government documents. At least separate that out. She has no real argument against that. So if I'm the Solicitor General, what I do is go to the 11th Circuit tonight or tomorrow morning, seek an emergency stay of this decision. And, you know, I was always reluctant to seek emergency stays when I was at the Justice Department, but in rare circumstances you would. This is that circumstance. So you stay this ruling about the hundred or so documents you let the criminal investigation proceed, and then you appeal the entire ball of wax, which is crazy, just slightly less crazy than the other parts of her decision. And let me just isolate one reason why I think that strategy makes sense. You know, there's a whole thing in the law about irreparable harm, which is, you know, if this investigation goes forward, who's harmed? 
And the Justice Department provided this affidavit that said, Judge, your special master ruling is going to endanger national security. And she says in her ruling tonight, well, I just don't see that based on, I guess, her extensive national security experience. And let me just, in a concrete way, explain how this matters. Because before I was acting Solicitor General, I was National Security Advisor at the Justice Department. Some of these documents are marked with HCS, that's human source material. And, you know, what that is, is like someone who is a spy, who maybe is working in a foreign government and is spying for us, something like that. They're in the field. Now, if you're that person in the field, right now you have no idea whether those documents that Trump brought to his golf club are, you know, are, are about you and who got to see those documents. If you're that person, you got to be freaking out right now. Now, what kind of intelligence do you think we're going to be getting from that person in the interim while we wait for the special master to reach uh, his decision? And would we want to reassure everyone else in the field that, you know, look, these documents aren't about you. They're about something else. And, you know, you don't have to worry. Wouldn't you want that assessment to happen right now? She just blows it off. Easy appeal, easy stay tomorrow. Uh, Bradley Moss, yeah, you've served as a defense, a criminal defense attorney in uh, classified documents cases. Uh, the part of the order that, uh, that is curious to me is uh, when the judge orders that the special master will show all of the classified documents to Donald Trump's lawyers. None of them have ever seen a classified document. None of them have any uh, security clearances. How is that done in that situation? Yeah, so they're going to have to get security clearances. They're going to have to go through the process, which can be expedited, to be fair. They'll have to fill out the standard Form 86. It'll get quick run through, assuming no immediate red flags show up. They'll review and inspect the documents in a secure facility in the presence of the special master. They won't be able to take anything out. Any notes they take will have to be reviewed for declassification. And if they are classified, they'll stay in the custody of the government or the special master. But here's the part that makes no sense to me when I'm reading this special master order. What's the special master going to do with these mar documents with classification marks? He's going to look at them. He's going to say, OK, I see top secret SCI with HCS, as Neil said. What do you want me to do with that? That's proper classification marking. All Donald Trump can theoretically say is, well, I verbally declassified them. And let's assume for the moment he gets Ash Patel and whoever to submit a sworn declaration saying, yes, I stood there while he declassified them verbally. So what? The relevant statutes don't care. The Espionage Act doesn't care. The two obstruction provisions do not care if the documents were still classified. They still had classification markings. He jerked DOJ around as no one, none other than Bill Barr said, and he didn't turn it over and they, his lawyers lied to the FBI. Whether or not he verbally or in his mind while playing golf declassified these records is ultimately going to be irrelevant. And I don't know what the special master is supposed to say there other than these, re these classification markings are valid. End of discussion. Uh, Andrew Weissman, let, let's go to a hypothetical possibility uh, with Raymond Deary. Uh, and that is, uh, assuming there was no appeal process that got in the way, but he, he got to work on this right away. He looks at the 100 classified documents in a day and immediately declares uh, these uh, should go to the government. The, uh, the uh, Donald Trump has absolutely no possessory interest in them, no interest in them whatsoever. Uh, that is how I have ruled. I am not going to show them uh, to the uh, plaintiff's counsel. Can he do that, and can he do that quickly? I think the part about not showing it to uh, plaintiff's counsel is where he could get uh, procedurally in trouble. Um, and it, I don't see him doing that. But what he can do is act very, very quickly. But to Brad's point is what he can do is say, OK, I see these documents we will turn to the Trump team in a way that Judge Cannon has not because he is an experienced federal judge. And he'll say, what specifically is your argument? You can argue these are declassified. That's irrelevant. These were called for by a search warrant. They were found pursuant to a search warrant. What is your argument? Um, and force them to actually have to say something. If you noted in the Trump's own papers, he refused to even say 
he declassified these. And as Brad points out, it would be irrelevant even if he did. But I think Jerry can sort of create a really good record by have really forcing Trump to come up with an argument related to these documents. I think it is it is actually better if the council is allowed to see it. So he creates a clean record and then he can just say, that's it. They're going to the government for all of their use. And and just remember, Judge Deary sat on the FISC. That is the, the court that deals with national security issues. He is going to understand exactly what Neil is talking about. And he is also going to understand the need to act quickly. He will give, I think, Trump and his counsel an opportunity to be heard. But then I think he's going to make a very fast, decisive ruling on this stuff. And I do think that's the main issue for the government. I mean, I agree that there are lots and lots of reasons to appeal this, um, prudential reasons. It's such a it's such a terrible decision. But I do think that Judge Deere at the end of the day is, is probably just a very, very good draw uh, for DOJ. And, and it'll be interesting to see whether Trump sort of ruse the day that okay. he, he selected him. OK, it feels like we're just getting started here, but the control room really needs a commercial <laughs> break here. So I, I'm just going to pause <laughs> us here for a commercial break. When we come back, uh, we're going to hear what Donald Trump testified in public today about those documents. And we'll go to that strategic question. We'll, we'll review that strategic question of do, does, should the Justice Department from this point forward just bet on Raymond Deary or, as Neil says, uh, mount that appeal? Uh, we're going to come back for that right after this break. Sinkholes are coming. You need to tell me what you know. The answer is inside that building. Does that mean there's a way out of here? I just want my family back. Today, Donald Trump appeared on the Hugh Hewitt show. Actually, it was a photograph of Donald Trump with Donald Trump talking into the show by phone. And that talking photograph testified, not under oath, about the evidence seized by the FBI from his Florida residence. Mr. Patel said he witnessed you giving verbal orders to declassify the papers that end up at Mar-a-Lago. Do you remember making those orders? That's correct. And not only that, I think it was other people also were there. Did you take those papers down there after declassifying them intentionally, or did you have any idea they were there? Remember this, remember this. Everything was declassified, number one. And if you look at the uh, presidential, if you look at the act that was passed, it talks about what you can do, what you can't do, how you negotiate with NARA. And then if you look at what's running NARA, it's radical left run, radical, radical left. Back with us, Neil Katyal, Andrew Weissman, and Bradley Moss. And he rambled on from there, but I kind of cut it off right around the point where the judge would if he was testifying in court and started rambling off about the radical left. Uh, Bradley Moss, so there you have a potential defendant's testimony, not under oath, uh, saying everything was declassified. Yeah, what I would remind Donald Trump is he has the right to remain silent. Everything he says can and will be used against him in a court of law. He's putting his lawyers into a corner here. They have no other option at this point but to try to concoct some kind of argument about declassification. Clearly, he's expecting them to put up something from Cash Patel and these so-called others who are apparently in the room. But here's the problem he's going to face whether it's before Judge Cannon or if it's through the special master or up to the 11th Circuit and the Supreme Court. The case law is clear that if he's going to try to argue, if there was an issue to be about declassification, if he's going to try to argue that in some fashion, he has to have specifically done it through particular documents. It can't be a general hand-waving order. He's got to go through a process. It's not me saying it. It's the court said it during his presidency. That's how they got out of having documents revealed, including from Andrew Weissman when he did his work on the Mueller report because of one of Donald Trump's tweets. They said, nope, nope, 
He didn't declassify anything. They didn't follow a process. It wasn't self-executing. There is case law that shows how this would work. He has done none of it. And to literally try to recreate case law for him and only him would be ridiculous. Uh, Andrew Weissman, it seems like uh, the judge may be a listener to the Hugh Hewitt show because that's the only place where anyone has uh, actually said uh, that this stuff was declassified. And she today, uh, in, tonight in her ruling, uh, took the position of how can I possibly know? How could I ever know, anyone know, if a document marked classified is actually classified? So one of the, there's so many, but one of her answers to the argument when the government said, you know, he is not actually disputing this. We show that this is classified. It bears all the markings of it being classified. And he is not saying he declassified. And she basically says, pish tosh. You know, you really can't expect him to have concretized, that's the word she used, his position because he hasn't seen these documents since they were seized. That, that is the most insane thing in the world. First of all, if he declassified them, you, he can say it. It doesn't matter whether he saw it or not. And how about the fact that he saw them for 18 months when they were in Mar-a-Lago, including in his own office? I mean, the idea that she wrote that, I mean, you sort of wonder, is there a law clerk? Is there somebody do trying to pull back some of the things that are more, you know, more inane in there? Um, but that's one of the reasons I think you're hearing from people like Neil, that you really have a very, very strong appeal here to, to get a stay of her decision. So, Neil, let's go to uh, your expertise here, which is the, the strategizing appeal, uh, uh, the appeal, quite the very question of whether to appeal tonight. So you have Raymond Deary as the uh, as the special master, uh, and th that's as good a choice as, as you could have. What about just placing a bet on Raymond Deary and saying the the court says he should be done by November 30th. Uh, by November 30th, we could be well on our way, authorized by Raymond Deary to use all of this material. That could be a lot faster than the appeals process. Yeah, I don't think you could do that. I mean, Lawrence, I mean, I could see it, but I think it's really unlikely. And it's because this decision is so, so bad. I mean, it is cray cray. And Lawrence, we suspected we'd get these kinds of decisions from her. Remember in her very first hearing, the only hearing she ever had on this case, she closed the courtroom. No live audio, no video, no tape delayed audio or video later. She even kicked out the people who were tweeting in there. And we never heard her ask a question. We never heard her voice. All we've got is these opinions, which are to put it mildly, cray cray opinions. And the, these opinions are filled with concepts that are really unfamiliar to American law. I don't know if she went to law school in Russia or something, but they're not American law. So yes, can the Justice Department say, well, Judge Deary is fabulous. Maybe he can act quickly. He can say there's no possessory interest that Trump has in these materials, that the classification issues are irrelevant. You know, all the things that Andrew and Bradley have mentioned. But here's my worry. Uh, it is gonna probably require counsel, his counsel to see these documents. And Donald Trump is not someone who can get someone like Andrew or Brad, who, who've carried these clearances in the past, to represent him. He's got a bunch of people who've never had them. And Brad's right, you can get clearances quickly, but clearances for SCI, sensitive compartmented information, human source information, the like, may take a while, and that could delay things. And then the other problem with Deary is, okay, let's say Deary moves quickly. He doesn't, he doesn't have the final word. Then it goes back to Judge Cannon, who's going to review everything, and we don't know how long that's going to take. And then Donald Trump's going to appeal this to the 11th Circuit when he invariably, you know, if, if he loses uh, that, and then appeal it to the Supreme Court. So, um, you know, delay has always been his strategy. And, you know, the problem here is that legally, the arguments that Trump makes are bogus. Like you just heard him on the tape talk about the Presidential Records Act. The R in the Presidential Records Act does not stand for reprieve. I mean, as much as Trump's, you know, kind of comments to Hugh Hewitt, you know, talk about, you know, how he can do anything. It is no get out of jail free card. It doesn't involve agency records, which these are. It doesn't involve nuclear information. There are so many problems with these arguments. The 11th Circuit can rule pretty quickly. 
And I think that's what they should do. Bradley Moss, uh, strategically, where do you think the Justice Department should go? I definitely think they should go to the 11th Circuit because if they don't, I'm going to use this case in everything <laughs> I do. I'm going to go after Andrew Weissman's record. <laughs> And I'm going to demand a special master to review everything Andrew Weissman did at the FBI, because this precedent goes against everything I've ever faced up against when trying to get records declassified, when trying to pry out information from the government through things like the Freedom Information Act and through pre-publication review. This would completely upend entire generation of case law. So there's no way the government can let it stand because they don't want FOIA lawyers and everybody else to be able to use it to start peeling back all this classified information. Well, there's also the fact uh, that the government said in its last filing that it would appeal uh, if the judge rules against them uh, the way she has tonight. Uh, so that, that appeal could be coming as early as tomorrow. Neil Katyal, Andrew Weissman, Bradley Moss can never thank you enough, especially on an important night like this, to deal with this breaking news information for us. Thank you all very much. Thank you. And coming up, Marco Rubio is a member of the Senate Intelligence Committee, and he is now defending Donald Trump's illegal possession of illegal documents at his Florida home. So how many classified documents does Marco Rubio have at his house in Florida? That's next. Score loads of valuable extras, but you must access to the nuclear codes of the United States of America. We cannot allow a con artist to get access to the nuclear codes. In stock availability, don't risk shortage and delay next year. Get yours now. Scan, click, or call today. It is time to open our eyes. We cannot allow a con artist to get access to the nuclear codes of the United States of America. That was Marco Rubio talking about Donald Trump in 2016. Now Marco Rubio is saying that the con artist getting caught with classified documents at his Florida home. This is what he's saying about that. This is really at its core a storage argument that they're making, right? They're arguing there are documents there. They don't deny that he should have access to those documents. What they deny is that they were not properly stored. I don't think a fight over storage of documents is worthy of what they've done, which is a full-scale raid. Joining us now is Florida Congresswoman Val Demings, a member of the House Intelligence and House Judiciary Committees and a Democratic Senate candidate against Marco Rubio in Florida. Thank you very much for joining us uh, tonight. And when I hear Marco Rubio say that, I, it leaves me hoping that if you have a debate with Marco Rubio in this campaign, you can ask him how many classified documents he has at his home in Florida. <laughs> Lawrence, it's great to be with you. And my goodness, the many faces of Marco Rubio. Thank you for that question. We are trying to get uh, at least three debates scheduled. Um, but, you know, it, it's it's just really amazing. Uh, Marco Rubio, as you've indicated, sits on the Intelligence Committee. So do I. And Marco Rubio knows what we have to go through to review classified documents, what it takes to enter the secured location, the skiff where these documents are kept. We can't take any electronic devices. And we know that classified documents can contain information from defense, intelligence, uh, nuclear capabilities or other capabilities or gaps, sources and methods. So for him to say that this is simply a fight over storage is irresponsible, shameful, and just, I think, clearly demonstrates just how far Marco Rubio will, will go for political gain. Uh, can you explain to Marco Rubio and to our audience why you would not store classified documents in your home? You know, it's quite shameful to um, you have to ask that question, uh, but let me explain to uh, the senior senator from Florida. Uh, there is no 
uh, ability within a private residence and certainly not one that is semi-private and open to public guests that would provide the top of security for the documents, the sensitive nature, the sensitive information uh, contained in classified materials, top secret materials that could actually jeopardize the national security of our nation and our allies. And for Marco Rubio, I mean, we all know how he basically carried on in 2016. Uh, and now what he is saying now is just totally uh, irresponsible and I tell you what, if you're looking for someone who will consistently uh, stand up for the rule of law and has the courage to do what it takes to protect our national security, you better look farther than Marco Rubio. Carswin Val Demings, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Always appreciate it. Thank you.